and the gospel. Paul spoke of those who professed themselves to be wise and became fools, Romans 1.22. 1 Corinthians 3.19, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. I remember uh, several years ago, this was back, I believe, in the 1970s, uh, over 40 years ago, here in Brother Franklin Camp, a faithful gospel preacher and writer from Alabama, preaching at the 8.30 lecture at Freed Hartman on 1 Corinthians. And I remember a point that he made. It still sticks in my mind. And he was preaching out of, on 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, without the gospel, man is totally ignorant. I mean, he emphasized totally ignorant. I thought that was a very fine and powerful point that he made. When you look in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 18 to 21, Paul said, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? If not God made foolish the wisdom of this world. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them to believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews of the block, and under the Greeks foolishness. By the way, before I go to verse 25, remember, these here in Athens were Greeks. They're included in this. Those who sought for wisdom and who considered Christ crucified as foolishness. Verse 24 and 25, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, that is, Christians, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Yes, my friends, ignorance spiritually is dangerous. It is deadly. It is destructive. Now, I like to go to the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. And here, Paul in verse 17 and 18 speaks to this matter. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walked in the vanity of their mind. Paul is addressing the Ephesians who were Gentiles in Christ. Don't walk like the other Gentiles. But then in verse 18 he said, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Here, notice that he said they had their understanding darkened. He declares of the ignorance that is in them and the blindness of their heart. How much plainer could Paul have said it to refer to those who are groping in darkness and ignorance and without God than the way that he said it? I'd like to go to 2 Peter chapter 3 at this time where the apostle Peter speaks of those who are willfully ignorant. 2 Peter 3 verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, that is the last days, the Christian age, Christian dispensation, scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, and there's a lot of other things that he mentions there. But notice that they were scoffers. They were mockers, and there are scoffers, and there are mockers included in what Peter is declaring here, and that they are willingly ignorant. That's why I was on to read the next passage from John chapter 12, Jesus here is speaking from Isaiah chapter 6, referring to Isaiah or Isaiah. And I want us to think about what Peter said about those that are willfully or willingly ignorant as we read what Jesus said. And by the way, what the Lord said here in verse 40 in John 12, 
Uh, he said, also in Matthew 13, verse 14, 15. Now, I'll take them from Isaiah chapter 6. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, that is Isaiah, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Again, referring to Isaiah chapter 6. You know, on the surface of this, if a person did not think and rightly divide the word of truth on this matter, they might say, well, here God intends for people not to see the truth and to remain in darkness and ignorance. No, that's not the case. That would contradict other teachings of the Bible, such as 1 Timothy 2, 4, that God would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And that would include these unbelieving Jews here. It wasn't God's will that they not come to the knowledge of the truth, but they willfully refused to see the truth. That's the idea. Their eyes were blinded, not that God did not want them to see or made it in such a way they could not see the truth, but because of their attitude of heart, they would not and could not see. And that's the idea of what Peter's talking about here. Well, friends, ignorance is a serious matter. And when you go back now to Acts 17, our lesson text, Paul speaks of the ignorance that prevailed in Athens. In Acts 17, beginning at verse 21. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something you think. Well, my son, these people really were learned people. Well, they were not uneducated people. They were not ignorant people as far as the world was concerned. In fact, many of them were highly educated. But they were ignorant when it came to religion and to God and to the way of salvation. Then we read in verse 22 and 23, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. You worship in ignorance. That is not an acceptable way to worship. Paul is trying to inform them of the true and living God and the proper way of worship and the way of salvation. But then, next of all, Paul denied scoffers. Now, in verse number 18, we read, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others saw him. He seemed to be a center forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. This term, babbler, was not a complimentary term they applied to Paul. In fact, it was derogatory. It really literally meant a seed picker, but it was according to divine of the Athenian slang for one who was outside a literary circle and ignorant plagiarist, one who picks up scraps of information and retells it secondhand, retells information secondhand. Well, what we know about Paul in the first place he was not an ignorant person. He was highly educated. But beside all that, Paul was an inspired man of God. He was a faithful apostle and preacher of the gospel of Christ. He had a message, and they needed it. They needed the message he preached more than anything in the world. But yet many of them mocked at it. The word mock here, and it's used in verse 32, we read, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. The word mock here means to ridicule. And this is in the same category of those scoffers that we read about a while ago in 2 Peter chapter 3. The American Standard rendering of 2 Peter 3 in one of those verses, In the last days mockers shall come with mockery. The idea is to sport. And... Uh, to jest, to play, or to ride. They would ridicule the idea that the Lord will return. Now today we have people just like that. They mock the resurrection. They mock at Jesus. They mock at the idea that one day the Lord's going to return. 
Have you thought about the fact that these in Athens and others who deny the resurrection are denying that Jesus Christ is divine, that He's the Son of God? We know this because of what Paul said in Romans 1 4. The resurrection declared Jesus to be the Son of God. In Romans chapter 1 and verse number 4 declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. To deny the resurrection is just as well as to say Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, but He is, and we know that. Paul declared how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. In verse 19 and 20 of that same chapter, we often call the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. The context of this is that if there is no resurrection, then we're to be pitied. We're of all men most pitiable. But, verse 20, Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Paul denied here those who denied Jesus and the resurrection. To deny the resurrection indeed is to deny Jesus Christ. In fact, to deny the words of Jesus is to deny Christ. And Jesus declared there will be a resurrection. In John 5, verse 28 and 29, Marvel not this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. They that have done good are the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil are the resurrection of damnation. <coughs> Oftentimes when we talk about the resurrection, we talk about being raised to eternal life. That's true for the faithful of God. But what about those who have done evil? They will be raised unto damnation. They will be raised up from the dead to be cast into the eternal lake of fire. We know this because Jesus declares in Matthew 25, 41, that he will say unto them, Depart from me, ye cursed, and to everlasting fire prepared the devil and the angels. But to the righteous, the sheep on the right hand, he will say, Come, ye blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, Matthew 25, 34. Now, in the third place, in Paul's denials at Athens, Greece, and by the way, I've also called this last Sunday the chapter of elimination. Because Paul is seeking to eliminate many things, idolatry, ignorance, and uh, many other things. He's seeking to eliminate by denying these falsehoods and these false philosophies and false doctrines. He is affirming soul-saving truth. Paul is denying the idea that man does not need God. Today we see so much of that, sadly, in our land. America has never been 100% Christian. We know that. There's always been the majority on the broad path of destruction, just like Jesus said. But there was a day in our country many, many years ago when more people affirmed and believed in their need for God and the Bible than there are today. We have uh, so much secular humanism which says that man is the measure of all things. Man can just be on his own and he's okay. He doesn't really need God. Friends, we know that's not the truth. There were two schools of philosophy mentioned here in Acts 17, there in verse 18. The Stoics and the Epicureans. The Stoics, uh, the Epicureans were atheists. And the Stoics had no notion of the resurrection. Now there are other things we can say about both of those schools of philosophy, but that's one thing that we know about them. And they remind us, uh, like many philosophers today, that deny various aspects of the gospel. There are those who deny God, the atheists, and those who doubt that we can even say for sure there is God, the agnostic. There are the evolutionists who say that everything just arose at random by chance and that God is not the creator. But Paul declares that God is real. He is our maker. He is our creator. And in so doing, 
He opposes atheism, evolution, agnosticism, uh, secular humanism, and many other isms that are false. Let's look at Acts 17, beginning at verse number 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Pause there for a moment. You see, we even need God for the very air that we breathe, our breath. And it made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. There's a song that we sing in the hymn book. And a song that I particularly like, as well as many others, but I like the song because it teaches humility to us. And it teaches us to express our need for God. And that is the song, I need the every hour. I need the every hour. Yes, we need the Lord every moment of every hour that we live. Jesus said that without me you can do nothing. John 15. Verse number 5 there at the end. Paul in Acts chapter 26 spoke of God's help that he had received. In Acts chapter 26, in verse 22 and 23. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none of the things and those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and to show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. But now, my friends, in the third place, Paul denied an impenitent attitude or the idea that a man doesn't need to repent or the idea of those who will not repent. Look at verse 30. This is one of the key marks of his sermon in motivating them and what they need to do. He said in Acts 17, verse 30, that at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Let me ask this question. Has that changed? Can we not also say that today? That God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent? Yes, we can. And Jesus taught that. He said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 35. Somebody might say, well, don't we need to uh, believe? Don't we need to confess Christ and be baptized? Yes, we need to do all those things. According to Mark 16, 15, 16, Acts 2, 38, Acts 8, 35, 39, all that's true. But here the word repent is used as a figure of speech called a synecdoche, where the part stands for the whole. Jesus used that regarding belief in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And there are many other examples that we could give. But God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That is to have a turning within, a change of mind, which is what repentance is, that leads to a turning without, a change of life in which man brings forth fruits worthy or meat for repentance. Matthew 3, 8, Luke 3, 8, Acts 26, and verse number 20. Man must repent, and all men everywhere need to repent. Everyone. There was only one person that did not need to repent of sin and turn to God, and that was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who did no sin, 1 Peter 2, 22. Jesus Christ did not need to repent. He had no sin, but everyone else who's ever lived and who lives now must repent because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. That does not exclude anyone. As Brother Roth taught this morning on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, there are some who deny the true nature of repentance. And I say that because there are those living in an adulterous marriage 
And they say, well, you know, I was baptized and I can just stay in the marriage I'm in. Although it's not according to Matthew 19, 9, the divorce and remarriage. I can stay in it because I've asked the Lord to forgive me <coughs> of everything and I'm sorry for the wrong I've done. Well, repentance is not just being sorry or saying that we're sorry. Paul said that godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. In other words, when one has a godly sorrow, a sorrow that is Godward in nature, in which his heart has been convicted, that he is convicted of his sins, and he desires to turn to God, the next step is a change of mind. And that repentance is not to be repented of. It's not to be regretted. That's true repentance. But now, in the fifth place, Paul denied two other philosophies that we probably heard of, or maybe even studied. Pantheism and deism. Now maybe, well I'm sure that we've not covered everything that Paul denied by his example and or preaching in Athens in Acts 17. But I want to look at these two briefly before we close. Pantheism. This is the doctrine that the universe conceived of as a whole is God. That's according to Britannica.com. And I read other things about it basically saying the same thing. That the whole of the universe is God. That God is not personal. It's not a personal God that you have a relationship with. But this universe, this creation out here, that's God. That's what pantheism teaches. Well, Paul denies this idea. He declares that the Lord is the true and living God. Look at verse 27 28 again. That they should seek the Lord and happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being and certain also of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. And who knows, they they may very well have had that philosophy present among the thinkers at Athens when Paul declared the truth there. Now here's another philosophy. Deism. It was said that some of the early uh, founders in our country were deists. The deists do not deny that God exists. But they promote the idea of a creator who does not intervene in the universe. If someone like what someone winding up a clock and just letting it go. That's their idea. That God created everything and just went off and left it. He's not personally involved with his creatures, with man. Do you know what this would deny? This would deny the providence of God. What a sad idea this is. To think that God is not near, that we can't find him, that he doesn't care what happens to us. Well, Paul denied that false idea here in Acts 17. He said, for in him we live and move and have our being. And in verse 27, though he be not far from every one of us. God is not far off and away from us. He cares providentially for this universe. This is a very popular philosophy back in the 17th and 18th centuries. As we conclude this evening, by denying false doctrines and false ideas and false philosophies, the truth is affirmed. Whenever we affirm the truth, we deny everything that is false, regardless of whatever religious doctrine or any other doctrine or philosophy it is. When we declare the truth, as Paul did here in Athens, Greece, then we deny everything that is false. Isn't that a wonderful reason to know the Bible? Just by reading Acts chapter 6 to 17, just look at the many things that would be eliminated from our thinking that are wrong. If we would just look at the truth that Paul declared, that's what we all need to search the Scriptures daily like the noble Bereans in Acts 17. Verse 11. We cannot affirm any truth without denying at least one falsehood or perhaps many others. Paul's sermon on Mars Hill is a classic example in dealing with unbelievers and philosophers. 
That's the classic example. These people were not steeped in a knowledge of Judaism and the old law. So Paul approaches them in a different way. He doesn't change the gospel message at all. But he is dealing with them as those who do not even have a belief in the old law of Moses in the Old Testament. Paul did not deny the final judgment, but rather declared its reality. Because he, that is, God, will have appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. God will judge the world in righteousness. What is righteousness? All of God's commandments, the psalmist declares. God's word will be the standard. God will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. That, of course, being Jesus Christ. Here he is called man. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, Jesus is called man and God. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. By that man and he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. My friends, this evening as we talk to people about their soul and the gospel, let's remind them that if they're going to be raised from the dead to have eternal life. They must be buried in Christ's baptism and raised to walk in innocent life. Romans 6, verse 4. Upon hearing and believing the gospel, Mark 16, 15, 16, confessing Jesus Christ, Son of God, Acts 8, 37, with a heart of repentance, Acts 2, 30, and then confessing his name, and then being baptized in that name for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. And then we must be faithful. Remember that God will judge the world in righteousness. That means that as we <clears throat> have obeyed the gospel, we must continue on the path to righteousness and live faithfully the Christian life. If there be any this evening you need to come, <clears throat> we invite you to do so while together we stand. Yes, would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with Him within the narrow road? Would you have Him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let Him have His way with thee. His heart can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see was best for him to have his way with thee. Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that ye need never fall? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see what's best for him to have his way with thee. Would you in his kingdom find a place of constant rest? Would you prove him true? He's providential test. Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see what's best for him to have his way with thee. Turn number 693.